recording. Fantastic. All right, here we go. So, Algebra 2 CP, good morning. Happy Thursday morning, April 23rd. I hope you're all having a fantastic start to your day so far and had a great day yesterday as well. We had a little bit of an introduction before I started recording about any feedback that you could offer on distance learning. If you do still have any feedback that you want to offer, I know sometimes when, when the camera is rolling, it, it, people get a little nervous. And I totally understand that. No, no worries. But if you do have any feedback to offer at any time, please, please, please feel free to just reach out and do so. I know that our time spent together has largely just been spent delivering notes and trying to be as uh, helpful as I can with my explanations. But if you want to do more, and I figured that was the most efficient way to make use of our limited time together. But if you do have any uh, more suggestions or things that you would like to see us do in this half hour block, always feel free to reach out and let me know with any feedback or suggestions or anything that you got. All right. So you could do so via email or send me a Google Hangouts message or whatever. All right, so that being said, um, a couple quick reminders. Number one, to make sure you have your microphone muted and your webcam disabled, which I'm pretty sure everybody's gotten, on, on, you've gotten used to that. Number two, also everybody's gotten used to making sure they fill out their attendance form in Google Classroom. One little r announcement that I have for you guys today, maybe you heard this already, that on Friday, uh, which is tomorrow, um, it is required that I collect attendance from you and post it in Aspen because it needs to be recognized as like an official daily attendance thing. And the reason why that responsibility falls on me is because it's your period A1 teacher, which just so happens to be me. Uh, so what I'm gonna ask is that on Friday, which is tomorrow, you do fill out that attendance form again, just like you did today, it takes two seconds, uh, but make sure you do it on Friday as well so I can log your attendance in Aspen. I'm not gonna require you to check into a Google Meet or anything like that. Just go ahead and fill out that attendance form. I will send you an email reminder that asks you to fill out the attendance form. And uh, I would ask that you fill out that attendance form by 9 a.m. And that is not a rule that's coming from me, that is a rule that's coming from above me, but uh, by 9 a.m., you should fill out that attendance form. I'll send it out at like 7 in the morning. Not that I anticipate everybody's gonna, anybody's going to be awake at 7 in the morning, probably myself included. Um, but I'll send it out at around 7. Uh, please try to just log in to fill in your attendance by 9 o'clock, and that would be great. It's just A1 that's taking attendance. Absolutely, Luke. Yep, he said it's just A1. Yes, just period A1 that's taking attendance tomorrow. Um, just to make sure that you are here, you're engaged, you're, you're actually you know, doing something. Uh, so that's really what it's for. Okay, you're present for the day. All right. So in order, sort of the logistical reason for that is for in order for it to be recognized as an official daily attendance, it needs to be logged with Aspen. Uh, in order for a teacher to log it into Aspen, that has to be your first period of the day. It's registered that A1 is the first period of the day. So, you know, long story short is that your A1 teacher needs to log your attendance. So just make sure you fill out that form tomorrow. I'll send you an email to remind you. All right, long-winded in introduction out of the way. Let's go into uh, to some examples of graphing rational functions. Today, after class, you do have your first assessment of the fourth quarter. I don't even know if I should call them progress assessments. They're really just assessments. Uh, God forbid I go with a crazy term that may be way out there, but I'm going to maybe call it a quiz. Oh, boy, a quiz. Uh, so regardless, though, you do have your first assessment. It is going to be sent to you via email. It's scheduled to go out at 1030. Um, right at the end of class. It is four problems on graphing rational functions, just like you did in the past. You can do out your work on paper, take a picture and send it to me. You could print the actual assessment. If you don't have access to a printer, you could just do it on a separate piece of paper. That's fine too. Just make sure that you get that to me by Sunday night at 11.59 p.m. The reason for the Sunday night deadline is so that on Monday, I can wake up and I can grade your assessments and get feedback to you, excuse me, prior to the start of class on Tuesday. I do think that that is more than a reasonable amount of time to get the assessment done. That's that's Thursday afternoon plus Friday plus Saturday plus Sunday to do four problems. So that being said, I am not going to accept any late assessments. Uh, so do make sure you get it Sunday, 11.59 p.m. The reason I can't also accept late assessments because I want to post the answer key so you can study from the answer key and all that stuff. So if the answer key is already uploaded and then you're like, hey, Mr. Giorgio, here's my assessment. It's like, uh, a little fishy there. Uh, so in any case, that's that's what we're doing. Make sure you get that done. It will be in your inboxes in just about 20 minutes. So let's take the rest of our time to actually go through some problems together. I have four problems that I'd like to show you on graphing rational functions. Um, it should really just try to hammer home all the points that I brought up previously. 
But if you do have any questions as I'm going through any of these problems, please ask because this is exactly what your assessment is going to be on. All right, so let's do some examples together. Okay, starting with something like this. I have f of x equals 3x divided by x plus 2 and then minus 1. All right, and I'm asking you to graph that rational function. Now, you already know that it's a rational function because there's an x in the denominator. So as soon as you see that, I should be trying to find my asymptotes. By that, I mean you have your vertical asymptote and you have your end behavior asymptote. The vertical asymptote for this function here would be x equals negative 2 because if you notice, negative 2 plus 2 is what causes that divide by 0 case, and that's bad. We can't divide by 0. That's why it cre creates that weirdness of an asymptote. Okay. In order to find the end behavior asymptote, I compare the degree of the numerator and the denominator. The degree of the numerator is 1 because it's x to the first power. The degree of the denominator is also 1, x to the first power. Therefore, they have the same degree. When the function has the same degree, we take the leading coefficient of the numerator, divided by the leading coefficient of the denominator, and then tack on the vertical shift. So here, it would be leading coefficient of 3, divided by leading coefficient of 1, which is 3 divided by 1 is 3, and then minus 1 is 2. So it should be y equals 2. Okay. Does everybody understand how to find the vertical asymptote and end behavior asymptote? Very, very important. It's the start of every rational function graph, so it's important that you know how to do that. All right, moving on. Uh, and if you do have a question, again, just ask. Okay. Now I can go ahead and sketch my actual graph. So let's see, something like this, something like this. Notice I left a lot of room kind of up top and on the left side because I know my vertical asymptote is at negative 2, meaning it's going through this part of the graph. And my end behavior asymptote is at 2, going through this part of the coordinate plane. So I know, like, I'm going to be working in this space over here. I don't need to put a lot of space over here and waste space on my paper. So that being said, I plot my asymptotes. Again, make sure you do not confuse the vertical and end behavior asymptote. Vertical goes up and down like this, and behavior goes left and right like this. All right, so the vertical asymptote is here, and behavior asymptote is here. Now I can go ahead and test some points to actually see what my graph looks like. So since my vertical asymptote is at negative 2, I go ahead and select two values from the left and two values from the right to plug into a table of values and figure out what they look like. So two values from the left is going to be negative 4, negative 3. Two values from the right, negative 1, 0. So we're going to plug in negative 4, negative 3, negative 1, and 0. And those points should give us a good visual of how to draw my curves such that they are approaching but not touching the asymptote. So let's actually do it. Negative 4 goes into my function. Again, when there's two variables, one on the top and one on the bottom, it's often easier to write it out rather than do it in your head. On the top, in the numerator, I'm going to get 3 times negative 4 is negative 12. In the denominator, negative 4 plus 2 is negative 2, and then minus 1. Negative 12 divided by negative 2 is positive 6, minus 1 is positive 5. So if I graph that, that's going to be at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Negative 3 goes in now. On the, in the numerator, I get negative 9. That's negative 3 times 3. In the denominator, I get negative 3 plus 2, which is negative 1, then minus 1. So I get positive 9 minus 1 is positive 8. So I get a uh, point at negative 3, comma, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Right up there. Next, we'll do the other side. Negative 1 goes in. 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. In the numerator, in the denominator, negative 1 plus 2 is 1, and then minus 1. So negative 3 divided by 1 is negative 3. Minus 1 now is negative 4. 0 goes in. So I have a point right here, by the way. 0 goes in. 3 times 0 is 0. In the denominator, 0 plus 2 is 2, minus 1. So I get 0 minus 1 is negative 1. And you should be able to see, by the way, that once we plot these things, do you see how the graph actually should look pretty symmetrical once you do this? Yes. Uh, you see how it's kind of balanced around this center intersection point? That should always be the case, so be mindful of that. It's a good way to check to make sure that you're doing the problem correctly. And now I'm just going to go ahead and draw some curves that are approaching but not touching the asymptotes. Approaching but not touching. Same thing down here. Approaching 
but not touching the asymptotes. Okay, very good. The last thing we have to do for any rational function like this is just identify the domain and the range. Okay. Again, your domain is where the graph is positioned with respect to the x-axis. So how far to the left does it go? How far to the right does it go? It does go forever to the left, hence that arrow, and forever to the right, hence that arrow, but it skips over this x-coordinate of negative 2. So your domain is negative infinity to negative 2, union negative 2 to infinity. And your range follows a similar pattern, but it just skips over the end behavior asymptote. It goes down forever, it goes up forever, but does not include positive 2. So it's negative infinity to 2, union 2 to infinity. And this, by the way, is exactly what you're going to be expected to do on that assessment coming your way in about 15 minutes. Does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns about that example in particular? No questions? Feeling good? Let's do another one. If you do have a question, though, feel free to interrupt. Okay. How about another example like this? We got negative 2 over x minus 3 and then plus 4. We want to go ahead and sketch a graph of that. Let's see what it's going to look like. So start out with our asymptotes, the vertical asymptote and the end behavior asymptote. Vertical asymptote, again, is just determined by the divide by zero case. I look here, I see what value for x would be very bad to plug in, what would result in dividing by zero. And hopefully you can see that it would be positive 3, because positive 3 minus 3 would be zero, and I wouldn't be able to progress from there at all. So my vertical asymptote is x equals 3. My end behavior asymptote, now I compare the degree of my numerator and denominator. The degree of the numerator, notice, is zero because there are no x's in the numerator. The degree of the denominator is one because I have x to the first down in the bottom there. So therefore, the degree of the denominator is larger. When the degree of the denominator is larger, your end behavior asymptote is zero from this chunk plus the vertical shift of four. So it's y equals four. Does everybody understand how we determine the vertical and end behavior asymptote? I'll ask just this one more time because now you got one where they're the same and one where the bottom's bigger. Feeling A-OK -okay about that? All right, cool. Now I can go ahead. Oh, Caden says, confused on end behavior asymptote. Well, let me try to explain it again, OK? I think these, these notes are the best things to, to help out here. So looking at the top one, let's, let's go through that top one again first, OK? In order to find the end behavior asymptote of these functions, we compare the degree of the numerator and the denominator. And degree meaning what exponent is x raised to. Okay, what's the highest exponent that you see for x? So in the numerator, the degree of the numerator for our first example we did today was 1 because you had x to the first. That's the biggest exponent you see. In the denominator, you also had x to the first. So therefore, they had the same degree. When your degrees are the same, your end behavior asymptote is equal to the leading coefficient of the numerator divided by the leading coefficient of the denominator plus any vertical shift that you have. These are the notes from before. So here, our end behavior asymptote would be 3, leading coefficient of the numerator, divided by 1, leading coefficient of the denominator. So 3 divided by 1 is 3, minus 1 is 2. Okay. For our second example, our second example is, an, is a case one type of problem where the degree of the denominator is larger. The degree of the denominator is larger because here the degree is zero. There are no x's in the numerator. In the denominator, the degree is one because you have x to the first. When the degree of the denominator is larger, the end behavior asymptote is zero from this piece plus the vertical shift of four. So it therefore comes out to be y equals four. Did that clarify that a little bit? I think it, it all goes back, no problem. It all goes back to these things. It all goes back to the cases. It all goes back to the cases. So very important. If you don't have that in your notes or you didn't write that down for whatever reason, that, that's like one thing that you absolutely need, okay, those cases. Cool. All right, excellent. Glad we cleared that up. So now that I have that, I can go ahead and actually draw in my graph here. Again, notice I'm kind of going to leave a lot of room on the top because... I see that my end behavior asymptote is y equals 4 right here. So I know I'm going to be working like up here in this region, and my vertical asymptote is x equals 3. 
So just a little pro tip to save paper and save space. All right. Now we can go ahead and create a little chart over here, a little table of values. Since my vertical asymptote is positioned at x equals 3, I want to plug in two points to the left and two points to the right just to get a picture of what my graph is looking like here. Are the curves up here? Are they down here? Is it over here? Is it over here? You don't know until you actually plug in points. So I'm going to plug in 1 and 2. I'm also going to plug in 4 and 5 because our vertical asymptote is at 3. So that's 2 to the left, 2 to the right. Take these numbers, plug them in. We're going to get... Uh, in the denominator, 1 minus 3 is negative 2. Negative 2 divided by itself is positive 1, plus 4 is positive 5. So I have a point at 1, 5, right there. 2 goes in. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. Negative 2 divided by negative 1 is positive 2, plus 4 is positive 6, right there. 4 goes in. 4 minus 3 is 1. Negative 2 divided by 1 is negative 2 plus 4 is positive 2. So I have a point right here, 4 comma 2, it's right there. And last but not least, 5 goes in. 5 minus 3 is uh, 2. Negative 2 divided by 2 is negative 1 plus 4 is negative 1 plus 4, 3. Right here. See how these are now like equidistant? See how they're nice and symmetrical? Everything should look like, if you get like a point way over here, then that's a Good indication that you probably did something wrong. So now I can go ahead and sketch my curves that are approaching but not touching the asymptotes here. Same thing down here, approaching but not touching the asymptotes here. That came a little close, but make sure you don't touch the asymptote. Okay. Now I can find my domain and range. My domain here, again, includes all the values except my vertical asymptote of 3. So it would be negative infinity to 3, union 3 to infinity. And the range would be all the uh, values to negative infinity, all the values to positive infinity, except for my end behavior asymptote of 4, negative infinity to 4, union 4 to infinity. Okay. Any questions, comments, concerns about that? Or feeling great? So far, feeling A-OK. -okay. All right, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Guess what? We got plenty of time for another one. So let's jump into another one. All right. What do we have here? Ooh, I like this problem. How about this? I mean, I like all the problems, but this one in particular is pretty nice. X divided by X plus 3. Just like that. X divided by X plus 3. Deceptively simple, right? Seems like, oh, this isn't that bad. There's not even a vertical shift, but we'll see what, what happens. All right, let's start with our vertical asymptote. Vertical asymptote here would be very clearly negative 3 because negative 3 plus 3 would result in dividing by 0, and dividing by 0 is very bad. We can't do that. That's why it makes the asymptote. Next, we have our end behavior asymptote. And behavior asymptote, to find it, we compare the degree of the numerator and the degree of the denominator. The degree of the numerator is 1 because we have x to the first. The degree of the denominator is also 1 because we also have x to the first. Therefore, they have the same degree. When you have the same degree, the end behavior asymptote is a fraction, the leading coefficient of the numerator divided by the leading coefficient of the denominator plus the vertical shift. Well, there is no vertical shift, so it's just the leading coefficient here, 1 divided by the leading coefficient here, 1. So your end behavior asymptote is y equals 1. Okay, because it's 1 divided by 1. All right. Now I can go ahead and sketch a chart. I have, or sorry, sketch a graph. I have, let's see here, trying to draw this best as possible. Something like that's probably pretty good. I may have to extend it down a little bit more. We have our vertical asymptote at negative 3. Right there. We have our end behavior asymptote at y equals 1. That's right there. And now I can go ahead and test some points. Let's just make a little table of values. Well, that was not, not my straightest line there. Uh, let's pick some values to test for this function. I know that since my vertical asymptote is positioned at negative 3, I'm going to plug in two values to the left and two values to the right. So we got negative 5, negative 4, negative 2, negative 1. Hopefully everybody understands now how we're picking those values. It's literally just counting. We're just counting on the x-axis to see, oh, let's plug in some values on this side, and let's plug in some values on this side. 
Let's plug them in now. Negative 5 goes in. In the numerator, we just get negative 5 by itself. In the denominator, negative 5 plus 3 is negative 2. Negative 5 divided by a negative 2 is going to be positive 2.5, or 5 halves, right? So I got a point at negative 5, comma, 2 and a half, right there. Try to do the best you can with labeling it. Negative 4 goes in. In the numerator, I get just negative 4. In the denominator, negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1. Negative 4 divided by negative 1 is positive 4. So we got 1, 2, 3, 4 right here. Again, before you even draw in your curve, since we drew in those guidelines of the asymptotes, you should be able to visualize how your function is going to look. You should be like, ooh, I could see that my function is going to kind of look like that, right? Approaching but not touching. Yes? Now we'll take these values and plug them in. Negative 2 goes in. I get negative 2 on top. In the denominator, I get negative 2 plus 3, which is 1. Negative 2 divided by 1 is negative 2. It's going to go right here. Again, you notice the symmetry that's going on with these points. Very important. Negative 1 goes in. We have negative 1 in the numerator. We have negative 1 plus 3, which is positive 2 in the denominator. So I get negative 1 half or negative 0 0.5 right about there. And if you take a look at that, again, you should be able to already see in your mind how these curves are going to look. They're going to approach, but not touch. The asymptotes here. Approach, but not touch. The asymptotes here. Okay. Questions about how that's done at all. As I do the domain and range, think about your questions as I do domain and range. So, oh, I don't know why I wrote them out next to each other like that. Ugh, that's okay. The domain, all your x values to the left, to the right, it just excludes your vertical asymptote. It's negative infinity to negative 3, union negative 3 to infinity. See, we, we adapt. We can make it work. The range, all the values going down, all the values going up, just not that horizontal, or sorry, not that end behavior asymptote. It's negative infinity to 1, union 1 to infinity. Literally just skipping over that value of 1. It's all real numbers except 1. Okay. All right, what do we got? About four minutes to go. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or concerns? All righty. I have a question. What's up? Could you just explain the domain and range? Because that's like the one thing I don't know exactly how to like find. Aiden, absolutely. I got you covered. So domain and range. So remember that domain means how far to the left is the graph going? How far to the right is the graph going? Where is the graph positioned relative to the x-axis? Well, if you take a look here, the graph is extending to the left forever, because that's what the arrow is doing. And it's extending to the right forever. That's what the arrow is doing. So it seems like it should be all real numbers, but the one value it doesn't include is this negative 3. Do you see going left and going right? It's like it hits this wall here where it doesn't actually ever hit that x value of negative 3. So that's why the domain is everything less than negative 3 and everything greater than negative 3, just not negative 3 itself. The range follows the same pattern where I'd say, yes, it is going down to negative infinity. Yes, it is going up to positive infinity. So it seems like it should be all real numbers, but it makes this jump here. And that jump occurs at y equals 1, where the end behavior asymptote is. So your range is all real numbers less than 1 and all real numbers greater than 1, just not 1 itself. In short, the vertical asymptote is where your domain skips a beat, and the range is where your end behavior asymptote skips a beat. Did that make more sense now that I explained it? Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, no problem. No problem. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments or anything like that? we got about two minutes to go. Everybody else is feeling good. Hopefully that clarified domain and range, which is good. Hopefully you got a good exposure for a couple problems here. One more problem I want to show you. I don't want to do it in its entirety because that would take too long. But I just want to make sure that I explain or maybe just point out. Maybe you already know this. But just point out, suppose you had a problem like this. This is the last one that I planned for today, right? What would actually be the vertical asymptote of that problem? What value, if I plug it in for x, would result in dividing by 0? 
you might be like, well, there's no like plus one and there's no minus two. Like, how am I supposed to tell? Well, really, it's just the simplest case of x equals zero, right? Your vertical asymptote would be the y-axis itself because there's no shifting going on in the denominator at all. All right, so I just wanted to make sure I clarified that point. Your end behavior asymptote for this one, by the way, would be negative four because the degree of the denominator is larger, so it would just be that vertical shift of negative four. All right, like I said, I won't run through that whole problem because of time, but hopefully, I mean, if you want to try it on your own, that would be a great idea to get some practice and do it on your own and see what that would look like. Um, but other than that, that's really all I have for you guys today. I want to remind you one more time that your progress assessment will be out uh, in your inboxes probably right now. It just ticked over to 1030. Uh, so probably right now you've re just received an email containing your assessment. Uh, make sure you complete that by Sunday night, please. I do really want to have that um, so I can grade it on Monday. I think that's plenty of time to get four problems done. So make sure I get that by Sunday. I'll grade it on Monday. I'll, your grades will be posted in Aspen, so you'll see all that feedback. And then we'll go from there on Tuesday. Speaking of which, on Tuesday, we are going to learn a little bit more on rational functions, specifically some more complicated cases of rational functions where we may have to do some factoring. So if you have a little bit of extra time and you're bored and you have nothing else to do and you're you know laying in bed and you can't fall asleep, maybe brush up on your factoring a little bit. So that would be a good thing to do before Tuesday. Okay. Other than that, I do hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Oh, remember to check in tomorrow morning for attendance. Remember to check in tomorrow morning. I'm just going to send the link out via email. Please do it before 9 a.m. That's all I ask. I'll send it out at 7 in the morning. Not that I expect anyone's going to be up at 7 in the morning. I won't even be up at 7 in the morning probably. But just saying, I'll send it out at 7 a.m. I'll schedule it to go out. Make sure you do it before 9. All right. Other than that, have a fantastic rest of your day. I will see you on Tuesday. It's not a long time. Have a great weekend and all that good stuff. Thank you for your attention and focus today. Later.